I'd like to now introduce David Osborne. David Osborne is an owner of the 20th largest real estate company in the United States doing with over 2100 agents doing over 4.5 billion in sales. How incredible is that? David is also an investor in 5KW re regions, 5 Keller Williams regions. He owns over 20 real estate ventures and he's also owns over 35 profitable real estate um, ventures in the United States and Canada. Personally speaking, David is somebody that I've personally looked up to for a long time now. With a knack of investing in real estate, with his ambition for living the life to the fullest and living one life fully lived, it has been something that I've always had, the, I've always been looking for the right excuse to be in front of David and get to talk to him. And I thought, you know what? How about we add value to everybody in the network for this incredible opportunity and maybe I'll get five minutes with the guy that I've always wanted to meet for the longest time. So without further ado, it is my honor, my pleasure to introduce to you David Osborne! Well, hey guys. So I have a secret to share with you. When Brenton called my team, they said this guy Brenton Hess is called and uh, he wants to know how much you would charge to come up and be on stage and, and meet and talk with Gary Vee. So I told my team, Brenton, I know you don't know this yet, I told my team, don't tell him this, I do it for free, but just get me as much as you can. <laughs> but don't cancel the check, man, we'll still keep the check, all right, brother? The next one's free. The next one's free. Look, it's great to be with you today. Um, I'm gonna share with you some stuff today that is literally how I live my life. Hopefully, you might find some of it useful. Um, I've had a good deal of success in life. I've been lucky. I've also had some great mentors, and I've been very committed to learning. I wasn't a great student in college or in high school. In fact, when I was in high school, I thought that D stood for degree. Also in college, I had a lawn mowing company, and I preferred working and earning money to actually going to class. But I made it through. Once I got through, I realized that in fact, learning for a lifetime is what makes a difference in how much you earn. And so what I'm gonna share with you are the few nuggets that me, a D student, has put to work for a lifetime that's helped me achieve success in life. You guys ready to go? Yeah. All right, sweet. Number one, I'm gonna give you five points today. Number one, have a plan. There are three must-haves under having a plan. Three must-haves. Number one, goals. You have to have goals. Number two, bucket list. You have to have amazing things that you're inspired to do for your future. And number three, optional, but I love it, a vision board. Like, I create a vision board. Now, let me tell you why. You guys are like, we've heard this, David. We know about goals. We know about vision boards, all that. We've heard it before. But let me tell you something. I've been doing some flying recently. No one gets in an airplane and flies from Austin, Texas to Maryland without a flight plan. You're in a beautiful basketball stadium. Nobody builds a basketball stadium without a blueprint. And you get to watch amazing TV shows. You're on Snapchat. No one designs Snapchat or makes a movie without a script. So my question is, What's the script you have for your life? You see, I have a script. I have 2016 with me right here. My script for 2016 is in the back of my journal. I carry it wherever I go. Everything that I want to achieve in 2016 is right here. I am dedicated to this script. When you see an actor or a basketball player playing their game, they're committed to that craft. The football game you get to see or the basketball game, it's not like they just show up and start throwing the basket around. They've got hundreds of hours of practice going into that moment that we get to witness. So my number one request of you that you might want to consider is to have the same level of intensity and focus and planning for your life. Have a script for your life that you wake up every day and pursue. 
See, my belief is that the subconscious is far more powerful than the conscious mind. So how do you get your subconscious aligned with winning so that you can get what you choose in life? Has anyone noticed that when you go to buy like a car, maybe you want like a Prius, you start noticing them everywhere. You notice that, right? It's called the reticular activator. That's how life kind of works. You ever notice if traffic's bad and you start noticing how bad it is, it almost gets worse because you're noticing all the bad things? That's how the subconscious mind works. So your subconscious mind really magnifies what you see and what's going on around you. So I have my goals just to really drive my subconscious into alignment with the things I'm trying to achieve. Your self-worth, your net worth will never exceed your self-worth. So when people go into sports and they get $100 million contracts, 75% of NFL players end up broke. Why? Because they weren't mentally ready to hold on and keep that wealth. And it's heartbreaking because of the, 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 the commitment those guys to do to their craft to being the best they can. But you have to have a mental readiness for different levels of success in life. And the number one thing that I've seen that all successful people do is they have a committed plan that they're following in their lives. And when you read this plan, one of my goals, the favorite goal I have that has really changed the effectiveness of my goal setting, because I've been goal setting for 20 plus years, is to review my goals 50 times a year. So I keep this journal uh, by a, a lamp. I get up early in the morning in my household, usually around five or six o'clock, depending. Um, I go over and the first thing I do is I open up my journal and I review my goals and I look through them, right? And so what I'm doing then is I'm literally writing the script into my subconscious so it's more likely to happen. And what I found is when I added the 50 times review, I went from achieving 30% of my goals to 80, 80 plus percent of my goals. And the second thing I do in my goals, and I'm just giving you this as an example that you might want to consider, is I put down my spirit drivers. And the spirit drivers are the goals that I'm really, really excited about, like the most amazing things in my life. Taking my six-year-old skiing is my new favorite activity. So I set the goal of skiing with her 20 times. There's nothing like watching my little daughter go from inability to ski to skiing down, I wish I could say blacks, because she can do them, but honestly, she doesn't like them. She likes to go down the easy blues, and I can see her get happy. Yeah, as a dad, I wish she was like shredding it and crushing it and catching air, but she just goes down the blues, and I can see her singing. I can hear her singing. I'm right behind her, and she's da 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 Like as a dad, like I'm giving her a gift by being with her that she'll never get any place else. And when I'm gone and buried and dead, my daughter will still ski, and maybe she'll ski with her kids. That's one. The other one is to go on an adventure trip every year. I believe in bucket list adventures. I said one of your, your uh, must-haves, in my opinion, is a bucket list adventure. So this year I'm going to Vietnam with 22 entrepreneurs, part of my tribe. My tribe is called Go Abundance. You take away the A from abundance. Any Go Abundance guys in the house? So we go on adventure mastermind trips every year. And our adventure mastermind trips revolve three principles. Number one is we do something scary and new. So this year we're going to Vietnam, we're gonna mountain bike, we're gonna on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, we're gonna motorcycle, we're gonna hike for a day in a cave apparently, we're gonna sleep in a cave, we're gonna be on a boat around a bunch of islands, we'll play ultimate frisbee because that's our sport. Every person that comes will bring their goals, just the ones I'm showing you, we all use the same model, and we'll sit there and we'll talk about them. We'll say, how are you, are you on track? Are you being a good dad? Are you being a good husband or partner? Are you doing the business commitments you made? Are you making money like you said you would? How's your health? How's your nutrition? We talk about this, right? We hold each other accountable. And then the other part of the bucket list is if you keep denying yourself really cool stuff, what are you telling your subconscious? Let's say, you know, raise your hand if you've got something really cool you'd like to do that you haven't done. Raise your hand high if you... And it's not even, okay, everybody almost, right? Here's what you're telling your subconscious if you never do it. And, and I know you've got a lot of reasons. I'm busy, I'm going through school, I don't have the money. But you're really telling your subconscious, I'm okay right where I'm at with this limited life. You're telling your inner being, there's no need for me to make more money because I'm not doing these cool trips anyway. So if you do the amazing stuff and you put yourself out there and you do the, what makes you a little scared, 
it tends to bring back into your body and your being energy and open up pathways for you to do more. So keep doing what makes you scared and do the bucket list adventures. And then the vision board is just something I use. So I have my lovely wife, who's a graphic designer, put out a picture of what my future looks like. And it's just a picture that hangs on the wall by my bedroom and it's got the things that I want for my future. Okay? And then the last piece we do on all of our adventure trips is contribution. So we always go to, last year we were in Peru and we went and built eight stoves for people at 13,000 feet. And it was probably the most rewarding part of the trip. We ended up in Machu Picchu, but building those eight stoves for people that end up getting emphysema and cancer because they cook over an open fire out of mud and pig shit, which is really what it was, right? Out of pig crap and mud is what we were, and straw. It was such an honor. It was such an honor to be able to serve those people, to see the elder of the village hovering around us and fixing all the mistakes we made. But knowing that one of the stoves we built was for a man that was in hospital who was not going to be able to, you know, they were hoping he was come back. And the reason he was in hospital is because he's cooking over an open stove. So now they wanted to send him a picture and then go down and tell him that now he has a stove with a chimney and his life will change. So we're always looking for a place to contribute. So if you don't have a serious set of goals that you're committed to for your lifetime, I encourage you to start now and realize that nothing great is built without a plan. And your number one focus for your plan is your life. And the very best thing you can do for every one of us is to live an amazing life. Because when you become an amazing person and live an amazing life, every one of us gets permission to live more. If your best friends and your community and your buddies are all you know, LeBron James and maybe Brad Pitt and uh, Julia Roberts, you're having a pretty amazing life, right? If you're around people that are up to cool stuff. So it's your obligation to live an amazing life and that will elevate the entire circle of your, of your people and your being. So having a plan for your life, having a committed view of the future is goal number one. See, I think actually our conscious mind is only about 1% of what goes on in life. All right, so you just really have to dig it in. Number two, point number two. There's only two reasons I believe you should be working in life. So number one is for learning. Learning is far more important than earning a paycheck. Ideally, you do both. But if Elon Musk called you today and said, hey, I want you to come be my personal assistant. If he called me today and said, I want you to be my water boy. And I said, well, what's that? He says, you walk around with a bottle of water whenever I want a drink, you give it to me. I'd be like, I'm in. He says, there's no pay. Okay. When can I start? Do you want me to get on a plane right now? Because I'll be there in whatever long it takes me to get my plane there or a plane there, right? Because learning will feed you for a lifetime. There is a mechanical way to win in life. There is a guaranteed winning formula. And the only way you get to the winning is by learning this formula. And it's not complicated, but there's a lot to it and you have to be committed to it. It's no different than winning at basketball. You gotta shoot it in the net. You gotta do all the practice. That's what it is, right? So if you're around guys like Elon Musk, or like I was lucky enough to be around a guy called Gary Keller. Gary Keller built the largest real estate company in the world by agent count. He's a future billionaire. I don't know if he's there yet. He's probably pretty, pretty close. But Gary Keller is a very, very smart guy. And I was lucky enough to be around him at a very young age. And so when you're around guys like that, you just learn. So the, the, the value of learning is much greater than the value of a paycheck. So if you have a job right now that you don't really like, but you think it's a stepping stone to someplace else, Get someplace else as quickly as you can, right? Selling your time for money is one of the lowest forms of living you could possibly have. Now, earning a paycheck while learning is a totally different thing, right? And the great thing about sales or real estate, anyone in real estate in the house? So in real estate, you don't get a regular paycheck. You only get paid when you perform. And the beauty and the joy of that is the way you perform at a higher level is by becoming a better person by developing better ability. Sure, you can make a quick buck by being dishonest. You can make a quick buck by being dishonorable. But the guys that last, the people that are around the long time, they build repeat business. They get a following because they are people that can be counted on. They live with integrity and they become masters of their craft. That's what's great about sales. But there's a weakness in sales too. And the weakness in sales is you can earn killer cash 
But that brings me to my second part of this one is the second reason you should be working is for equity. There's nobody that's wealthy in life that doesn't have equity, right? So what is equity? Equity is ownership of some stuff. You can own shares in a company, you can own houses, you can own businesses, operating businesses, but you will never get wealthy in life without equity, right? So you should be working for knowledge and or equity or both. And where I make an exception to earning a paycheck is if you can take that paycheck, let's say you're getting pretty good pay, and then in the evenings you're learning on your own and you're taking that pay and investing it in equity. So in that case, I'm okay with you earning a paycheck. But the sooner you go to work for yourself, as terrifying and as scary as that is, the sooner you burn the boats and start trying, the sooner you'll fail, which is awesome, because when you fail, you learn far more than when you succeed, and as you start failing and failing and failing, you inevitably get wiser and wiser and wiser. Unfortunately, sometimes the wisdom is a kick in the teeth, and other times you just learn by observing and being around the right people. So two reasons you should be working, knowledge, and then second thing, equity. All right. So my third one, plant trees and manage orchards, okay? I've been pretty lucky. I have about 45 income streams, and I've built all my income streams by planting trees and managing orchards. So let's get into this. You should write this down. One of my goals is to plant trees and manage orchards. Another cool thing about real estate is you don't have to be that smart. Like I said, I'm a D student. I didn't exactly invent the iPhone. I haven't uh, design, done anything in medical technology that's gonna make a difference for the world. Um, I meet really smart people and I'm like, wow, that guy's really, really freaking smart, or that lady's really, really smart. I couldn't do what they do, but I can do real estate because real estate is all about making one plus one equal two and a quarter and then repeating it over a lifetime, right? One plus one equal two and a quarter. So how do you do real estate? Plant trees, manage orchards. You do one good deal at a time, right? Who in here owns a rental property? Raise your hand high. Good, good number of you. Now when I say plant trees, manage orchards, I don't mean buy orchards. So some people go, why would you buy real estate? It was so bad in two, if you bought in 07, you got killed in 08. True, but you know the guys that got killed the worst? Some guys just got unlucky, but here's how you get killed the worst. You go to Vegas, you buy eight condos with zero financing required, no money down, right? That's not a planting of a tree, that's gambling, okay? You go buy a house that you can't afford at 100% financing. That is not planting a tree, that's gambling. When I say planting a tree, I mean you dig the hole, you look at the property, you're looking at properties on a regular basis. Write this down, you'll never do deals if you don't look at deals. You have to look at deals all the time, 100 deals a month. You need to be looking at deals. Send me your deals. I meet guys all the time, they're like, hey, have you considered investing in this? Sure, send me the deal. 99 out of 100, we pass on. We don't want that. And you say, well, why would I look at deals? I don't have money. It doesn't matter if you have money or not because you want to become expert at looking at deals, right? So even if you don't have the money, keep the deals coming. You'll have questions. So how are you going to do that? How does that work? Why does the company need to lose a million dollars before it can make money? You'll pick up knowledge and information. And real estate especially is pretty straightforward, right? So on real estate, there's some other things. You're digging your hole, you're looking at the property. Okay, does it need repairs? What's the repair budget? If I have it repaired and rent it out, what will it rent for? Because I always put 20% down on my properties, with my 20% down and it's leveraged, what's my cash flow? Do you know the number one asset for most Americans for all their wealth is their house? And whenever someone tells me this, I'm like, what's your net worth? Because I have some intimate conversations about people's net worths, and they'll say, 200,000. I'm like, how much of that is in your house? They go, 75%. I'm like, why do you only own one house? How long have you been a doctor or a professor that you could have bought more houses, right? Because I own 100 houses, I've never sold a house I lived in, and you're smarter than me. So why don't you own more houses? I talked to a doctor in LA, he's like, yeah, I got my house, it's worth 1.7 million, I bought it for 700, I'm very happy. I'm like, why don't you own two, right? And so you go back to why people don't own them, well, because it's a hassle, it's a headache. 
I don't want the management. I don't ever manage a single house of mine. I hire a manager every time. You know what I learned early on is, I don't want someone to call me at three in the morning and say, uh, Mr. Osborne, the bathroom just broke right after I put a big old deuce in there and it's kind of leaking all over the floor. Would you come fix it? Like, no, I don't want wealth if that's what I have to do. I'd rather be poor. But if, but you know what, you can hire a manager for 8% of the rent, 8% of the rent. Like if I have a thousand a month coming in, that's 80 bucks a month. Where can you hire a human being to work for you for 80 bucks a month? Property management. There are smart, capable guys willing to work for 80 bucks a month. So every single one of my properties managed by a manager, right? I'm still digging my holes though, because when I do my property management, I don't buy it unless it cash flows after leverage, after property management, after vacancy, and after repairs. So you guys are thinking, I don't want to be in property. Don't listen to the property story, listen to what I'm telling you because it, it's true in operating businesses or subway franchise shops or anything you want to buy. The digging of the hole is doing the due diligence to make sure that whatever you're getting into is going to manifest a positive outcome to the best of your ability. And if you'll do that digging of the hole, getting your hands dirty and planting that tree, making sure it's in fertile soil, giving it a little bit of water and you'll make that a habit you won't be the guy that bought eight properties in Vegas and went bankrupt because you'll have a certain uh, astuteness about you. You'll have a certain way that you go about things that will be due diligence. You'll be diligent. That's the word I'm looking for in life. So that's real estate, right? So I own a bunch of real estate. I've had some losses, but I've had way more wins. The second thing is operating businesses. So it's a little more complex and much higher risk, but how do you manage an operating business? Same thing. First, you got to look at the numbers. What's the most likely outcome? What's the worst case scenario? And what's uh, the best case scenario? You try to operate from the most likely, right? So you run your budget. The numbers are the most important. Now, I failed calculus, and then I dropped it, and then the third time I passed it, and then I took calculus two. It was actually, was it calculus two? It was actually easier than that. What was it? Microeconomics, that's what it was. It had calculus in it. Failed it, dropped it, passed it with like a D, okay? So I am not a math whiz. But I know my numbers, and all you have to do in real estate is know one plus one equals two. How can I make two equal two and a quarter? And in an operating business, all you gotta know is, okay, how many nutritional supplements do I have to sell to offset my overhead, and what is my overhead? Okay, I got an employee, I got a lease, I gotta buy my product. Right? And if I'm doing the employing, the work and I don't need an employee, so what does that add up to? 20 or 30, right? And then can I sell 40,000 a month of product? And the reason you have to become a master of the numbers, even though I don't like them, is because you can't run a business effectively. You can't be diligent unless you understand your numbers. I know a young man that has three karate schools, right? And, and, and I work with him, I coach with him a little bit. Oh, is he here? Hey, what's up, Sam? If you guys want to pick a fight and test yourself, that's the man to pick a fight with. So he runs three karate schools and he's an amazing personality and super successful and they're making money, but what am I hammering on just like I was hammered when I was a young man by Mo Anderson, my teacher, my mentor, who was the CEO of Keller Williams at the time, is you got to know your numbers. You got to look at that stuff. If it looks like Chinese, just keep looking at it. And if you look at it for three to four to five years, it'll start falling into place and making sense. And all you really got to understand is there's uh, employees, there's rent, and there's stuff. That's about it. There's three major categories. And then you have revenue, and if your revenue exceeds those three things, you can plant a tree that can be an operating business and then get it built and then step back. And when I say managing orchards, the reason I can run 48 companies is because it gets easier to manage people that will manage the businesses for you. I got lucky enough to spend time with Richard Branson. Richard Branson has three guys that report to him that manage all of the enterprises he's got at Virgin. And Richard is not only a billionaire and a serial entrepreneur, but he's dyslexic and he dropped out of school at 16. Right? He told me when I met with him, he said, I didn't know the difference between revenue and profit for the longest time. And my CFO kept pulling me aside and saying, Richard, you keep saying, re you keep saying profit when you mean revenue. Right? He's like, oh, which one's better? Right? And so, so the guy said to him, look, imagine it's, it's a, you catch a bunch of fish in a net and some of them fall out. The ones that fall out, that gross, including those, that's revenue. The ones you actually get to the table, that's net. And he's like, oh, okay. 
So if he can do it, if I can do it, you can do it, right? So it's just a discipline, it's a commitment, it's a choice. Planting trees and managing orchards, being due diligent. And let's go back to what I said, like the subconscious mind, right? If you wanna be a wealthy person, then you have to work on your subconscious mind. The way you work on your subconscious mind is doing the due diligence, looking at the deals, understanding numbers, so you prepare yourself for a lifetime of abundance and success, all right? But it all ties back to the first thing I told you about, which is setting goals. And your goals could be as simple as reading one finance book or real estate book a year. It could be listening to a book on audio tape, getting Deeper Pockets podcast or some other podcast and listening to that. I mean, there's just so many ways. Once you know you have a flight plan and you choose a destination, there's so many ways to take yourself to your destination with a continually evolving flight plan, which works out to be your goals, right? And I can tell you this, if you are not prepared for success, it doesn't matter how much of it comes to you, you can win the lottery and you can be broke as people are within three to five years after winning the lottery. Because you have to be prepared. All right. So my fourth one, which is perhaps my most uh, exciting one and most important one, is your environment, right? Your environment must support your goals. So let me start with the first environment. The first environment is your mind, okay? What comes into your brain is your environment. Anyone sick of politics yet? I mean, are you like tired of watching that stuff? I mean, did they run for office in America for like two years? Um, what about the news? Like who watches the news a lot? See, I cut all that stuff out. I don't let junk come into my head, right? So I don't watch CNN, I don't watch the news. I just try to bring into my head things that will help me in my plan, my flight path, my script for my life in 2016. So what's coming into my head might be a book on how to be a better dad. A book I read this year called The Family Boardroom. It's about, okay, when you're with your child, are you fully present to your child? Why don't you make a commitment to have a board meeting with your child four times a year where you drop in 100% to your child, leave your phone behind, be fully present to your, to, your, to your child. What are you putting into your head, right? Is your idea of fun sort of like MTV, what's, it, what's an MTV show, the real world or whatever? Or are you like watching things that could improve and grow your mind? Are you watching Tony Robbins? Are you reading books? Are you listening to books on tape? Are you listening to podcasts? So the environment of your mind must be protected. Here's the second one. You might not like this as much, but your peers your friends. Who do you hang out with? We have a tribe called GoBundance. The meaning of our tribe is the tribe for healthy, wealthy, generous men who choose to live epic lives. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to surround ourselves with people that are goal-driven, that have outcomes in life they want to have, that are moving forward in life towards destinations. Because in life, you know, you watch the show The Biggest Loser, the saddest thing about it is, those guys, uh, they, they lose all that weight and then they go back to what? Their tribe. They go back to that environment where everyone's drinking beer and ordering pizza or whatever it is and there's no changes made and they revert. If you don't change the tribe you hang out with, if you don't change the people you're around, if they're not willing to grow with you, then you will have a much harder time breaking free, breaking out of the orbit that you were in. So the sad thing about changing your peers is that um, it's hard sometimes. Like you have to sometimes say to a friend, listen, I know your idea of fun is to um, get together every weekend, have a barbecue, drink a bunch of beer, watch football all weekend, argue about who's the best sports team, and do that Saturday for college, Sunday for football, Monday for Monday night football, and then every night of the week just for a couple beers just to have fun, right? And I respect that that's your choice in life. But I'm choosing to do something different with my life. I'm choosing to build a bigger life. And in order to do that, you and I have to either agree to go the way I want to go or I'm going to have you be my once a month friend instead of my everyday friend and move on. Because you have to surround yourself by winners. And what's interesting about being around winners is that it gets so much easier to win, right? So, so when I'm around Sam and I'm around Rock and I'm around the guys I hang out with, they're hugely accountability driven people. They want outcomes. They want to make a difference in the world. And so when I choose to make a difference, I don't feel like an alien. I don't feel like an odd person. I actually feel like I'm not the only one that wants to try to make a change, try to improve things. Um, 
So surround yourself by the best people you possibly can. And by the way, if, if people walk away from you that you kind of like when you're coming up to them, you might want to work on yourself to get to a place where they stop walking away, right? And if you commit to the life of personal growth and self-mastery and you shut out the junk and you have your script for your life, you'll inevitably start rising and you'll inevitably start surrounding yourself with different people. Now I got pretty lucky because I got into Keller Williams when it was a brand new company, right? So, so my, com my secret to success was joining a company that was one of the fastest growing real estate companies in the world. Because it was growing so fast, they needed people to step up and to take opportunity, and I stepped up and took opportunity, and we were literally the Southwest Airlines of real estate, and I got in on the ground floor. So that served me really, really, really well. The second way I got lucky was that I felt like real estate was too hot in the 2000s, so I went all cash. I didn't go into real estate in four, five, six. I was way early, but I just thought, man, it can't just go up forever. And then just around 06, I started to think, maybe it is gonna go up forever. And then it changed. And then I bought a ton of real estate in 2010 and 2011 and 2012 and it did really well. So I got a little lucky. But there's another guy in the room I want to tell you about. And this guy's not so lucky. His mom moved here from Peru when he was eight years old. You know, he grew up, American kid, didn't know any different, graduated high school, wanted to tro go try get a job and guess what he found out? He found out he was an illegal alien. And he found out that because he was an illegal alien, he couldn't get a job because he didn't have a social security number. Right? So he was smart enough and resourceful enough to go ahead and create an LLC and then sell himself to a car company, GM. So he joined GM and he worked for them uh, for a couple of years and they paid him 60 grand a year. Now when I met this kid two years ago, uh, I think he was making 60 grand a year working for GM. He joined our tribe and, and Diego started investing in properties. Now today, Diego is 25 years old. He's in this room. He owns eight rental properties. His passive income from those eight rental properties is just under $4,000 a month. He's gotten his real estate license. He sells real estate. The Dream Act enabled him to start working under his own name. And he makes $125,000 a year as a realtor. And he's still only 25 years old. Who, who, how did Diego get lucky? But what did he do? He committed to the path of self-mastery. He came to some GoBundant stuff, joined the M1, started getting around people that were driven in a good and positive direction, and then he brought his own willingness, energy, and desire to that equation, and he became a successful man. Now imagine where that kid's gonna be in 10 or 15 years. I mean, the future for him is unlimited. I was actually, uh, in a seminar with him uh, two days ago and I told the same story and there was a really, really pretty girl in the class. I mean, really pretty. And I'm married happily, I got two kids, so, um, but, but it's nice to have a pretty girl in the class, you know, it's always nice. And then at the end she was coming up and I was sure she was gonna come talk to me because I thought I knocked it out of the park. I was like, wow, that's good, she's gonna come talk to me. And you know what she did? She came halfway, detoured over to Diego and she was just talking to Diego. <laughs> and I went up to Diego at the end and I said like, dude, how, what happened? How did you, uh, how did you make that happen? He goes, I just leveraged you. <laughs> so, so he's smart, like he's a smart kid. There's another guy in the room here today that's a friend of mine from Dallas and he makes a million dollars a year or has maybe six, seven hundred, eight hundred million, whatever. He's a very, very good mortgage officer, very good loan officer from Dallas. He does really well, works incredibly hard, has an amazing life story, spent the last two years going to high school in the back of his car. Um, his dad threw him out and never spoke to him again when he was 16 years old for various reasons. So Wally makes a million bucks a year. He also started buying property. Wally currently has 15 rental homes. So he's different from Diego. He makes a lot of money and he's buying rental homes. He just started buying them two years ago. He's got up to 15. His passive income is $35,000 a year. And when I talk to, to Wally, what I tell him is those homes you're buying that 35,000 a year that you're making is more important than the million dollars you'll make. Because I'm 49 years old, I've been around a while, I've been through some crashes, and I've seen superstars come and go. And you know what I've seen? I've seen agents show up and make a million dollars a year for one, two, three, four, five years. And then you know what happens? A crash occurs, they didn't do anything wise with their money, and they end up broke. So Wally, 
what he's doing with the properties will end up serving him more in the future because it's an equity play than the monies he, he's earning. Because he's planting those trees one at a time, he's building his portfolio of assets, and he's building equity for his future, right? So two different examples, one guy makes a lot of money, one makes a little money, and both of them are on a journey of personal growth. The other thing in your environment that you have to control, so I get to hang out with Wally, I learned from Diego, uh, I'm just really honored to be around these guys because any one of you, any person that chooses to, to, to live a life of the hero, the hero's journey where you're going on your path, not distracted by the noise and the junk of others, but going on your path is a friend of mine, right? Any person choosing that brings value to me and are a blessing to me, and just as I try to be them. So the next thing on the environment is your exercise and nutrition. Exercise and nutrition. Your money is if essentially energy, right? The more energy you have, usually the more money you have. So nutrition and exercise is a discipline and a habit that you must establish for a lifetime. It's your environment has to be healthy. Your body is the ultimate gift that you get to use one time. My view, I don't know for sure, but it seems like it's one and done. So the more you can look after it, the more it will give back to you. So how do you develop habits around health? Well, I have no willpower, right? I will eat chips at four o'clock. I'll eat ice cream if it's in the house at four o'clock. So to make my environment support my goals, I have no chips and no ice cream in my house, right? I'm not a Puritan, I'm not a perfectionist, so I have a little dark chocolate because that seems to be okay. But I don't have, and I have some chips that are sort of like these newer, like organic-y, sort of like made of uh, quinoa or something like that that my wife buys me. You know, and they're not perfect, but they're better. We're moving in the right direction. And then I have uh, salads in my refrigerator at all times, fresh salads, so I'm hungry, I can munch on, on salads. I have um, a bunch of like nuts and fresh fruits out at all times, visible, easy to get to, so when I'm eager to snack, and just grab the good foods, right? I surround myself with athletic people that are successfully looking after their bodies. Guys that are driven, guys that are good skiers, like guys that love to play ultimate frisbee. That's our sport, ultimate. Now, I want to be really authentic with you and really transparent. My high school sport, wait for it, you're going to be very impressed, was Dungeons and Dragons. Has anyone played Dungeons and Dragons? So I'm just telling you how it was. Like, I'll just be really honest with you. Like, I was kind of maybe not quite a dork, but probably a nerd somewhere in there. Like I got along with people, but I wasn't the first guy being invited to, invited to a party. Let me tell you that, right? So, so I wasn't a great athlete. My older brother kind of was, but I wasn't. I wasn't terrible, wasn't great, right? I'm a better athlete today than I ever was in high school because I surround myself with guys now that in the middle of the day they say, hey, let's go play Ultimate. Yesterday we met and we played Ultimate here at the University of Maryland and it was a lot of fun, right? And uh, so by being around people that are committed to health, it makes it that much easier for you to commit to health. And then by having around you a circle of environment that's healthy, healthy food, healthy stuff, it makes it easier. You're trying to make all of life go easily for you. You want it to move in the direction you want it to go and make it as easy as possible because that whole notion of standing on a pile of bloody bodies and beating your chest like you're Conan the Barbarian, it actually doesn't work. You might get one or two good victories out of it, but at the end of the day, if you're gonna force your way to the top all the time, eventually you're gonna break and someone else will be standing on your body with you covered in blood, right? You wanna make your life easy. And the way you make it easy is by setting the intention through your goals and then building an environment that makes it easy for you to get there and then surrounding yourself by people that are committed to the same thing. Patience is the mother of all victories. Patience is the mother of all victories. If you set that intention that I want to be healthy, prosperous, abundant, uh, have great friends, find a way to make contribution, if you set that intention and then you set your goals around that intention and then you surround yourself with things that make it easy for you to go in that direction, you start setting yourself up where failure is impossible, right? If you think about it again, let's go back to the sports analogy because we all love our sports. When you're a basketball player or a football player, they feed you while you're at college. They, they manage your schedule. It's not like they have training workouts for you. Uh, they, they manage what they put in your body. They have medical people look after you. They have a whole team that keeps you in tip-top physical health while you play sports. 
Unfortunately, once you're done, they say adios and then you're on your own. What I'm encouraging you to do is for a lifetime, build that same network of team around you so that you can build your life forward and, and succeed effortlessly. Um, the other one you have to have is a personal trainer. Whether it's yoga, whether it's a workout person, I'm a big believer in having a personal trainer. Uh, you have the appointments, you prepay for the appointments, there's no ducking out. So having a personal trainer again, because ultimately your body is what's gonna determine your level of success. And then your environment also ties back to mentors. You have to have mentors and people that will teach you for a lifetime. There's so much good wisdom out there and the way you're gonna get that wisdom is by being around people that have lived before. It's not a secret, people have lived before us and some of them have succeeded and some of them have failed. Some people's life stories are a lesson of someone to follow and some people's lessons are a lesson of someone to avoid, right? So put yourself with a bunch of mentors who are your teachers that show you a good way to live. Here's a little exercise for you. If you're working in a certain kind of job, look at the most advanced person in your workplace and ask yourself, do I want to be this person? So let's say you're at the post office, look at the most senior post office person and say, is that where I want to go? If you're a salesperson, this is kind of interesting, right? Go look at the oldest salesperson that's working and say, is that the future that I want for myself? Because one of my dear friends, a guy called Pat Hyben, who's my peer partner, and he was a realtor for a long time, and he said, I, I used to have this dream that I was 75, he was at Century 21, that I was 70 years old, I got out of my car, put on my golden jacket, and then just burst into tears. Because he didn't want to go on one more listing appointment. So you've got to ask, is the path I'm on going to take me to the destination that I want to go? And if the answer is no, then start making those changes right here, right now, today. All right, and then my last pillar. Ultimately, it's about contribution. Finding a way to give back to others. So, you know, in 2008, I was working for a company, Keller Williams in Austin. I, they, they gave me a high paying job. And I got the call that no son ever wants to hear. And it was my mom calling me to let me know that my dad had cancer. And she, she asked me to come home. So I was in Dallas. Um, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, flew up and drove down with me. And I got to spend three years nursing my dad. And I got to spend three years nursing my dad into the grave. And my dad um, was a Green Beret colonel. He'd had uh, 30 years in the military. He was a bull of a man, incredibly strong and incredibly fit. And cancer just riddled his body. It took him down. And he still worked out every day until the day he got cancer. He tried to fight through it, but ultimately the cancer won. So one day I was sitting with my arm around him and I was, I was in the TV room and he was sitting beside me and his once strong face was swollen from the steroids and, and his stomach was protruding over his belt and, and I knew he was dying. And I began to ask myself in 2008, what is life all about? You see, until that moment, I think I'd been living life as if life, here's the end, here's the beginning, was like this. Like they were moving along at the same time. But the reality is, there's the end, here's your life. It's moving along like this. And so as I was sitting beside my dad, I began to ask myself, what could I do to make a difference? Like where could I go out and make a difference? And um, so I did a little research. So here's something for you. One billion of the world's population live on a dollar a day. One billion of the world's population live on a dollar a day. 750 million people don't have access to clean water. So imagine this, here's your day. You wake up and you go three hours with a big tub to get your clean water. And then you bring it back to your family and you decide, is today the day we water the plants, clean ourselves, or cook our food. That's how 750 million people live. One million live on a dollar a day. The day you were born in America, Warren Buffett says, you won the lottery. People born in America have the best opportunity of anybody in the world because of the economic opportunities we have here. So 
so I asked myself, where could I make a difference? And I met, so I, I spent some time looking at different, you know, charities and doing it in different places. I cannot change, none of us can change the destinies of those one million people. There's not, not, I could give them every penny I have, it won't make a difference. But what's cool about life is there are people that, are, that have lived before. There are people that have felt what you felt before. And there are people that are trying to make a difference in the same way that you're thinking maybe I can make a difference. And instead of starting something from scratch, you can actually hook into somebody else's efforts. So I began to analyze different charities. I looked at multiple, a bunch, like five or six. And then I met this guy, Scott Harrison. And Scott told me a story. He works for Charity Water. Anyone know Charity Water? So Scott told me a story about, and, and by the way, the money you donate to Charity Water, 100% goes to building their wells because they have two charities. The second charity pays for the backbone which supports that. So 100% of the money goes to the wells. And Scott told me an incredible story about a girl in Africa who had walked three hours to get the water, an hour and a half there, an hour and a half back. And she had a clay pot that she carried the water in. And she dropped it. And it broke. And she was so humiliated and ashamed that she hung herself. And she was 13 years old. And so I learned this story from Scott. I was crying the entire time, as was everyone in the room. And I decided that that was going to be my cause. And I'm telling you this because each one of us has an obligation and responsibility, in my opinion, the way I see it, to take up a cause, to take up a banner. Because not one of us can change everything in the world, but every one of us can change one thing in the world. And in reality, what's the point of having great wealth or building an abundant life if you can't find a way to pay it forward and to make a difference, to give unto others? So I joined the well, which is the backbone of Charity Water, which is a financial commitment. And I gave away my birthday for Charity Water. And we raised enough money to do seven wells, which will change the destiny for, I don't remember, 3,000 people, 4,000 people. And I decided that Charity Water was going to be my choice for contribution. And, and my fifth pillar of life is really that. You have to find a place to contribute. You have to find a place where you can make a difference for one person or more. And in order to do that effectively, you have to develop two skills. One is integrity. You've got to keep your word. Do what you say and say what you mean. So here's what's the value of integrity. Here's the value of doing what you say and saying what you mean. If you do what you say and say what you mean, life will begin to take you seriously. If you say, I have my goals, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to work out five times this week or three times this week, whatever, and then you don't do it, what is your subconscious hearing about you? See, I keep my word not because I want my mom to pat me on the head and tell me I'm a good boy, although I don't mind that. I keep my word because the, the, the world has to take me seriously when I keep my word. So that if I keep my word in the little things, if I go to the gym when I say I'm going to, if I have the date nights with my wife I say I'm going to, if I spend time with my child as I commit to, if I do the things that I say I'm going to do, then the universe starts knowing it has to take me seriously. And if I say I'm going to go raise a million dollars for charity water, I'm going to go raise a million dollars for charity water. See, if, if Richard Branson came to this room right now and said, does anyone here want to, raise your hand if you would like to start a business with Richard Branson if he offered. Richard comes in here, he says, who wants to start a business with me, right? Or let's say he said, let's start a new charity. Let's do something good, right? Who would want to do that, right? Yeah, almost every one of you. Because we view Richard Branson, we don't know him well enough, but we view him as a person that does what he says he's going to do. You, you got the feeling that if you got in business with Richard, Sir Richard, I guess, if you got in business with Sir Richard, good things would happen from the actions you take. And why is that? Because we know he's a risk taker. We know he's bold. We know he's started multiple companies. And we know he's persevered through trials and tribulations to get to certain levels of success. And that's integrity. That's what integrity is. Integrity means you say what you mean and do what you say. Now, will you fall short of that? All the time. Every single day you will fall short of what is your potential. 
But integrity says you get back up and you try again the next day. And you keep moving your life from where you say this and you do this. See, this is one of my favorite learnings of all time. And I'm going to draw it for you because they nicely brought me this, this, this thing here. So this is called concentricity. All right? And so being non-concentric is when you say this and you do this. Anybody know anyone like that in here? Anybody ever been that way occasionally? Right? So you say, I'm going to go work out 200 times this year, right? New Year's resolutions. I'm going to do all this and nothing happens, right? Most people live where what they say and they do has some kind of an overlap, okay? And it's right, right here. But your goal in life is to drive this to where what you say you do. Successful people, in my experience that I've been around, you can count on them to do what, they're gonna, what they say they're going to do, right? That's the skill, that's to me what integrity is. You do what you say and you say what you mean. And if you become this person, life will open up for you. It will start moving for you. You'll start being able to make stuff happen. And if you're this person, it doesn't matter what you intend to do. Just keep on talking, baby, because it doesn't matter. I go to parties sometimes and I meet people and they're like, oh, I'm going to do this and that and the other and I'm going to do the other, right? And I remember because I love good conversations about people that are up to something. And then I go to the next party and I'm like, hey, did you start that charity coaching kids, the Gold Star Kids? And they're like, what? What are you talking about? I'm going to do this. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. And it's completely different. And you know what I do? I go, I can't be around this person. I got to get away. Because I got to be around people that do what they say and say what they mean, right? Because that makes it easier for me. Of course it's easier to cheat or be unethical or slip and slide and, and just talk and not do stuff. That's easy. This is the journey that's more difficult and more challenging, but once you commit to this path and you become more and more this way, actually the, the riddle of the universe is that it gets easier, not harder. Your life gets easier when you keep your word, because then it gets easier also to say no. See, a lot of people say yes because they want people to feel good. So they say, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. And then they don't do it because they never really wanted to do it. But once you know you're going to do everything you say, you start saying, no, I can't do that. No, I can't help you with that. All right. So this is the journey of concentricity and saying what you mean and doing what you say. One of my favorite learnings. The other piece about contribution is you've got to look for ways to serve. If you want to win in life, Look for ways to serve. Look for ways to help people. Look, to look for ways to be to, of service to others. So for instance, you wash your hands after going to the bathroom, I hope, and you're wiping your hands off on the little dry towel and you throw it and you miss. Do you go pick it up and put it in the trash or do you leave it for the janitor? Or is that his job? How about you're driving through your neighborhood, you're not in a rush, because sometimes we can't do this, and there's like something in the middle of the road, a stick, a twig, like a branch. Do you ever just pull over and pick that thing up and move it, get it out of the way? What about when you're pouring yourself a glass of water at lunch? Do you look for everyone else that has an empty glass and pour their water as well? Because let me tell you, my friends, one of the secrets to the universe is that if you'll serve as many people as you can, your life will change your life will elevate. If you can do the very best job for every single person you can, your life will start transforming. And I'm not saying be a servant, okay? There's a difference between serving and being a servant, okay? Being a servant is an honorable career choice if you choose it, but that's not what I'm advocating. I'm saying look for opportunities to serve. Find a way to make a difference, not just when you're getting paid, not when people are looking at you, not when it does you a benefit, but all the time, every single moment of the day. Can I help you with that? Can I pick that up for you? Can I carry that? Look for ways to take care of others, and if you keep doing that, it's part of the transformation you can go through. If you look for those opportunities, people will start seeing you as someone that can be counted on. So look for opportunities to serve. So let's go back to the beginning. You've got your goals, right? You take your goals, right? You set your script for your life. What do you want? Set your areas of health. Set your goals in areas of family relationship. I always put family and relationship first because sometimes 
it's a challenge for me moving at the speed I like to move to slow down and get back in with my, my family and my beloved. I've learned that the, the best way to get along with my wife is just to be within about 10 feet of her and just look at her and listen to everything she says and not speak. That's how we get along the best. <laughs> because when I try to fix things for her, she, she just doesn't think I'm listening. So I just sit there, I listen, I try to pay attention, I try to be present for her. I found that with my daughter, we have to bargain because the way I'm present to my daughter, I can't, like, I can't play Barbie, I just can't do it. Like, I can't do it. I can do it for five minutes or so, maybe 10. So if my daughter wants to play Barbie, but I, I'm committed to having present time with my daughter, so I'll do, here's the deal, I'll play 10 minutes of Barbie with you, and then let's go shoot hoops. Or let's go, like, bounce a ball around, and we'll see if we can do it 20 times. And she'll agree to that, so we do a deal, and then I'll play Barbie for 10 minutes. So I always put family first. Spiritual contribution. So you start living a life of goals. I'll tell you one of the goals, it was kind of a miracle that happened for me. I put on my goals, give away a scholarship. And then I forgot about it. I forgot I'd put it on there. I just thought it'd be a cool thing to give away a scholarship. Well, one day, my wife comes home, and our nanny is crying. And she's crying at the sink. And my, my wife goes up to her and says, this was last year, why are you crying? She says, my goddaughter is the youngest of four boys. The parents have paid for all four of the boys to go through college, but they've got to decide between selling their car or paying for their daughter to go to college because they're in economic difficulty. And my wife was asking me, but she didn't need to. The answer was already yes. Can we pay for her college? So boom, we got the opportunity to give a scholarship. It's only $4,000 a year, so it's not really that great, huge of a gift. But how cool that I just put it on the goals and then it's almost like by magic something showed up that gave me the opportunity to give, to contribute. All right, so contribution. Uh, by the way, with the Charity Water people, I'll be going with them to Ethiopia next year. I go back to what I said about contribution. I put contribution on here because what's the point of becoming fabulously wealthy? Why would, and I'm not gonna talk, I, I don't go to any formal religion, but I do like to pray a lot. What would be the point of giving someone massive abundance unless they did something with it? See, I believe there's a secret DNA code that wants everyone in this room to be massively successful and massively abundant. And we don't choose it. Maybe because we're scared of it, maybe because we don't know what to do with it. But I can tell you what you do with it. You go shine it on others. The only reason to be massively successful, other than there's pretty cool lifestyle benefits, is to find ways to give it back and make a difference to others. And so going to Ethiopia, you see the benefit of that. Doing our, our, our stoves in, in Peru, we get to see the benefit of that. Your body, looking after your body, 240 workouts. I got that on here. Hire a trainer, do yoga 50 times a year, right? And then if you'll see my goals, you'll notice I strike things out. So I keep my Roman numerals in here. So I'm actively looking at this on the regular basis. This is truly my flight plan. When we're flying in the plane and I'm up in the co-pilot seats, let me tell you, if there's a storm, we adjust our flight plan. We go around it, okay? And that's the same as your thing. You gotta be looking at it all the time and making adjustments. Um, reading books, personal financial, and then the business goals, okay? So. What else do I want to tell you guys? Ultimately, my only wish and dream for you is all of your dreams come true. I have my core tribe here, the guys from GoBundance. They have a table somewhere. Where's your table, Rock? Outside in the hallway if you want to go learn more about those. Uh, Brenton, how much time I got, buddy? You got to turn my mic on. All right. Can we do um, questions? Yeah, well, I would love, the great news is we're running a little ahead of schedule. So could we do a couple Q&A with the audience? Yeah, questions. You guys want to grab some running mics? So um, if you, first two people to stand up and raise their hand, we'll hit you back to back with questions. We got one and two. I'm sorry, my eyes went the uh, shirt and tie with your left hand up. And yes, you're standing. So let's get you guys. Yeah, just yeah, yell. yell, and David will repeat it. Yeah, let's do that. So, um, uh, I was, uh, I am 20, 21 years old, and I'm working on, I'm founder of my own business. So, what would, what advice would you have for the young people in this room for how they should get started in following their dreams? So, that's, his question is, I'm 21 years old, I have my own business, what advice would you give for me? Okay, so great. Other than the five points I just gave you, right? <laughs> okay. So the number one is um, be a master of your craft, 
right? So you've got a business. What space are you in? Uh, it's in helping uh, undergraduate STEM students. Okay, helping undergraduate students. So here's what I see. I go to WeWork. Anyone been to WeWork? And I see a lot of people that are, yeah, it's a really cool environment, but a lot of people are just kind of hanging around to hang around at WeWork, right? Like it, it's a cool, like almost like being at a Starbucks. So they're hanging around doing business to do business, right? My question for you is, you're in this space. What's the best thing that could come out of this space, right? What's the best outcome? Vision that out and create that as the direction you want to go. So let's say you're, you're serving a thousand people. Could you serve a million, right? How big could you take that? Secondly, if I take it big, um, what's the worst that could happen? What's the downfall? Like, what's the worst thing that could happen? Like, could I lose all my money? Could I go broke? And then build towards your good side and protect against the downsides. So the way you protect against the downside is you don't sign personal guarantees if possible. You don't have overhead that's greater than your income if possible. You become a master of hiring and a master of leverage. And if you do those two things, uh, you will be able to scale your company bigger. So keep the vision in mind, keep driving towards the vision, protect the downside, and then ultimately at your age, you're 21, how many employees you got? Just two. Just two. Read a book called The E-Myth and build your company so that every single thing you do, you can hire someone to do it at some point in the future. Okay? Second one. Yes, right there. Hi. Yeah. So what's the makeup of the audience? Yeah, I mean, other businesses. Okay, so here's how you win in other businesses, ultimately. Because I also own a lot of operating businesses. I've got 17 operating businesses that do different things, mostly real estate, but I've got an insurance company and some other things, all right? So here's how you operate a business. Number one, you get in a space where you can make money, whatever you're doing. If you're a CPA, if you're a lawyer, if you're whatever you're doing, if you're serving graduate students, you get into that space and you do it. And then you do it really well and you document what you do. And then you hire a team and you move from, from I do it to we do it. And when you have a team, we do it. The two, the three of you, whatever it is, do it together. And then you built your, your model. Your, 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 either you are writing down the job descriptions or you hire someone, because they are available, to write out the job description of what you do. Then we do it. And then the next level, which is the ultimate level, is they do it. But when they're doing it, they're doing it based on the model and the program that you created that you've trained them on, okay? So that's, that's where you wanna go. I do it, we do it, they do it. And that's the same in every business, whether it's a sandwich shop or a nuclear physicist, you know, a pharmaceutical company, right? Ultimately, for you to get leverage, you have to have leverage from one of three things, okay? Leverage comes from money, Leverage comes from systems, and leverage comes from people. So your job as the entrepreneur, the founder of the company, is to design the systems, hire the people, and then ultimately, hopefully, that gives you the leverage to go bigger or do something different. Yes? How do you find mentors? That's a good question. You know, there's an old saying, it's a cliche, right? When the student's ready, the teacher appears. Here's the cool thing about mentors. They don't have to be living and they don't have to be your friend. You can Google stuff and watch videos of people. Jim Rohn's my favorite. Go live and listen to The Art of Living by Jim Rohn 50 times. One of the greatest speakers of all time, right? So I lived that. When I was a kid, I listened to that stuff so much in my early 30s. I'd say that's a kid, some of you are younger, so you could be way ahead of me. I listen to that stuff so much that I would teach it. I could almost say word for word the way Jim Rohn spoke, right? Jim Rohn would say, you can't have four springs. You don't get four springs. You get summer, and then fall, and then winter, and then spring. And you better hope that when it comes to the harvest time, you planted your seeds in the spring, right? So Jim Rohn was awesome. I adopted and lived his life, right? So if you will take on mentors that aren't present to you, you'll eventually find more mentors. And the truth about the journey of life is, as you work on your craft and you commit to the things I've shared with you today, integrity, your goals, becoming the best at what you can do, learning to serve others, people will show up in your life. 
So recently, a lady has become my mentor. She took two small companies public. You might have heard of them, Dell and HomeAway. She's worth about a half a billion dollars. And I met her at a networking event. And at that networking event, a mastermind group, I asked her to go to lunch with me. And she said yes. And at the end of my lunch with her, I had notes and I had questions. I asked her to go to lunch with me. I said, would you be willing to do this again? And she said yes. And then a month later, I called, I reached out to her people and I said, can I have lunch with her? We booked it and she said yes. And I sat with her and I had four lunches with her and then a miracle happened. She had a falling out with someone she worked with in her private equity firm and she asked me to come and be a partner with her in her firm. So people will show up for you and you have to be the person that when they show up, they understand that you're for real, you're serious, you're committed to your craft, you're committed to your destiny, you're committed to your outcome. You're not gonna watch MTV Cribs or whatever the heck they put on TV on a regular basis. You're committed to being a great human being. And, and they'll see that in you. And, and, and the end of every session I have with a mentor is I say, what can I do for you? Like, thank you for your time today. Is there any service I can do for you, right? Or you could email like a billionaire, like a friend of mine did and say, what would I have to do to earn lunch with you, right? So it's all about that service piece. You go back to the service thing. Look, ultimately in life, if you serve enough people and you become the best human you can be and you keep getting back after you fail, it is impossible for you not to win in life. I love you. It's been an honor to be with you. Thank you very much.